<clears throat> Chapter six, we're going to look at thermochemistry, which should be fairly obvious that based on the name, we're going to study heat in chemical reactions. This definition, actually the definition I learned in grade school for energy was the uh, capacity to do work. They didn't put the heat part in there. But when you think about it, yeah, energy's got to go somewhere. And it either does useful work or it just blows off into heat. That's why automobile engines get hot because some of the energy in the gasoline goes to driving your car and the rest of it is blown off as heat. Okay, so the law of conservation of energy is always there in the background. In other words, you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy, you can only transfer it from one form to another, from one place to another. <clears throat> another way of putting that is actually the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, and we'll, I think we talk about that a little bit later when we get to entropy. Yeah, we'll talk about that again. Um, another way of putting it is the total energy content of the universe is constant. In other words, another way of saying that also, you'll see the first law of thermodynamics stated this way. Change in energy for the whole universe is zero. There's not, I mean, we've got so much energy in the universe, and that's it. Based on this law. Here we find something better. We can uh, create a perpetual motion machine, maybe. <laughs> um, it's also important to note that there very rarely does any chemical or physical process occur that doesn't involve a transfer of energy. They nearly always do. The, the exceptions are very rare. In fact, some that appear to be a not a transfer of energy. In other words, um, uh, a reaction which is safe enough to, to grab the vessel with your bare hands, you may not feel a temperature change at all, or you may measure it, no temperature change. But actually what's going on at the microscopic level is, yeah, there's, there's energy being transferred. It's just not showing up as a temperature change. Um, what may happen is uh, these bonds are being broken, which would give up energy, and then these bonds are being formed, which consumes all of that energy. Okay. We can um, subdivide energy into two forms, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy can occur in uh, several different forms, the most common of which are positional potential energy, uh, due to your height above the surface of the earth, or actually your height above the surface of any heavenly body. Um, it takes energy to move you from one position to higher in that gravitational field. And in my physics course, when I teach it, it's kind of rare, but when I do teach it, we look at this uh, uh, change in positional energy for different heavenly bodies. On the earth, there's, there's one factor, one constant value, as long as you're close to the earth, one constant value that operates. But if you're doing the same thing on Mars, it'd be a different value. And your height change on Mars takes less energy. But um, once you've attained um, an increase in height due to your position, then you stored up energy in your position. And the way to get it back is just remove the support. Like if I jump out the window, I'll get that energy back going from here to the ground. And it'll be great until I hit the ground and then there's another energy conversion. <laughs> Broken bones and heat, stuff like that. But you know that you've got potential energy if you go from one height to the other and uh, you acquire energy in a different form. 
Um, composition is another form of potential energy, and that's the one that we deal with predominantly in chemistry. Composition means um, uh, well, it can mean several things actually. In chemistry, it basically means bonding. You can store energy in bonds. And that's why nitroglycerin, when it's disturbed, will give up a lot of energy because a lot of those bonds are broken. In that one molecule, we break bonds and we make about four different gases. Uh, and in breaking those bonds, we give off a lot of energy. Plus, we take a liquid and expand it into a gas, which is a thousand times times the volume and, and uh, builds up a lot of pressure. So there's energy there also. Or you can speak of com compositional energy in terms of electrostatics. So if you, uh, if you take two negatively charged objects and you try to push them together, they're gonna resist. But, and it takes energy to push them together. And then if you have some way to hold them there, then that energy is stored until you release them. Um, magnetic also, you take two mag magnets with the North Poles together and you try to push them together, you can feel them resist. You, it takes energy to make them get close. And then if you, you can lock them in that position, you store the energy in that magnetic field. Okay, kinetic energy. So I mentioned kinetic energy a few minutes ago, jumping out the window. Right before I hit the ground, I've got a lot of kinetic energy that is uh, transferred to me from my positional potential energy. And those values are equal. The energy that's stored from due to my height will be roughly equal to the energy that I attain in terms of kinetic energy. And kinetic energy can be calculated for any object. All you need is this formula. One half mass times the velocity squared. That's kinetic energy. Um, so what happens if, what if you measure your kinetic energy as a speed right before you hit the ground and you calculate your kinetic energy? And then you calculate your positional energy um, due to your position above the earth, which was, which is equal to, let's see, um, I know height's in there, I know G is in there. Let me see, it's gonna be joules, which is kilogram meters per second. Kilogram meters per second. Meters squared per second squared. Thinking out loud now. Height would be in meters. G would be in. Meters per second squared. Okay. Oh, so we need mass. I knew I was missing a term. Mass times the acceleration due to gravity times your height. You calculate your potential energy uh, right at the window. And then you compare those two values, right? Um, the potential energy you had at the window should be equal to the kinetic energy you have right before you hit the ground. If it's not, what happened to it? We can't create or destroy energy, right? So there must be some other forms of energy that, that uh, will bleed off that potential energy and allow you to only have a certain amount of kinetic energy um, friction, which, which generally uh, converts in something into heat, is the predominant uh, thief of that potential energy. Okay. Well, actually, I don't want to complicate things too much. When you think about uh, heat on the molecular level, it's a form of kinetic energy because molecules are moving. And if you, if you make them hotter, they move faster. So they're actually building up kinetic energy. So technically speaking, you've only got these two, potential and kinetic, that's it.
All right. So illustration, uh, transferring energy. Suppose we've got this A ball and the B ball, and they're both the same size, same material, same everything else, except for position. B's at this position, A's at that one, being held in place at this point. So A has more potential energy than B due to their height difference. So if we release A and A smacks B, it transfers all of its energy uh, that it had from up here to B, where would you expect it to go? Well, it should go up to the same height. B ought to just roll right up here and A will be left behind. That would be a perfectly elastic collision. But in reality, B ends up here. Right? It doesn't go all the way up there. We've lost some energy in the transfer somewhere. Like I was mentioning earlier. So, and it's usually due to friction. Right? Um, a 100% elastic collision is only theoretical. <laughs> it never happens. You can get really high, like 98, 99% transfer. What does an elastic collision mean? Do you have any physics? Okay, so elastic collision is one in which the kinetic energy, total kinetic energy before the collision is the same after the collision. Whereas an, a totally inelastic collision is the uh, kinetic energy before it, relative to zero, uh, after zero, you know. Well, actually, I can't say that. That's not right. Um, I'm just trying to make a comparison here. An inelastic collision would be they would both strike one another and then they'd move off together in the same direction. And a lot of that energy would be lost. They probably would just move right over here and stop. Um, but the uh, loss of energy here is largely due to friction. You can have friction against the surface. You can have internal friction where when you, when you strike, there's compression and you're forcing molecules to move past one another, which um, increases their kinetic energy internally, which is interpreted as friction. Okay. And I just answered that question. Okay, let's pause for a moment to clarify. It's um, easy to get these two terms confused. Temperature and heat, they're related. They're like second cousins. But temperature is an intensive property. Temperature is um, the same no matter where you measure it in an object, no matter how big the object is. If it's, a, if it's uniform at one temperature, then you're going to find that temperature anywhere in that object, no matter how big it is. That's an intensive property. Temperature itself. Uh, we know now is a measure of the average kinetic energy of all the molecules, all the particles in the object. So if they're moving faster, you have a higher temperature. Now, they may only be vibrating right, instead of motion. If they're a gas, they're probably all moving. If it's a liquid, um, they may be moving past one another, but not much. Uh, and solids, uh, their only option is vibration. Um, okay, that's temperature. Temperature is a measure of something right here. Whereas heat is a measure of transfer, as you get a transfer. You can make it go backwards, but that requires an expenditure of energy to do that, like air conditioning in your house. Okay, so there's a difference there. Temperature is like a state, how it is now, 
heat is a, is a transfer, it's, it's motion of, of energy from one place to another. Okay, um, we need to define another term here. We're gonna use a lot, it's called work. Right. We mentioned earlier, energy uh, is the ability to do work or create heat. So we need a definition for work and that this comes from physics also. Work is force times distance. So if you, uh, if you apply a certain force, and it doesn't matter what, it, what it's against, just force, you're pushing on something with constant force for a given distance, then you've done work. But if I, if I push on this wall, no matter how hard I push, I'm applying a force, but it's not moving. So there's no work done. I'm still expending energy, so we have to account for energy transfer, right? But since it's not moving, the energy has to go someplace and it most often goes into heat. So I'm heating up that wall by pushing on it. <laughs> Difficult to measure, but uh, nonetheless true. So we'll come back to that definition later. I just wanted to get that in here, shoehorn it in for, for later discussion. Um, now, uh, I need to define a couple of more terms, and these are, these are kind of difficult to wrap your head around. Um, at least I found that to be true for myself. When we talk about two different types of function, a state function versus a path function. A state function is any property that doesn't depend on past or future of the system. If we define a system and we characterize it right now, then the terms we use are considered state functions. Okay? Whereas if we follow a property through changes, then uh, this path function is a measure of their dependence upon the course that they were taking. That's the fundamental difference between state and path. Now, when we start talking about uh, thermochemistry, then there are some terms, some measurements that we make that are path functions and some that are state functions. Okay, and we have to define those. Um, work and heat, so this value right here is a um, path function. And this value right here, heat, is also a path function. The transfer of energy is a path function because we had to get motion. We had to move the, the heat from some place, one place to another. And it could take a circuitous route to get where it's going. It might heat this up and then that would heat that up. That would heat that up. <clears throat> or we might do work. We might um, uh, slide a box up a hill, incline plane, right? It takes a certain amount of energy because we've applied a force through a distance. Um, if we try to deadlift somehow uh, that object, the same height that we reached on our incline plane, it would take uh, a different amount of work for various reasons. Uh, one might be friction, right? You push a box up that hill, you got to fight friction with that force. But if you deadlift it, maybe it takes a different force through a different distance. Okay, so, so work is a path function also. Okay, we'll come back to that. We're not, we're not leaving it forever. It's just uh, introduce the topic and then and, um, we've got to define some other things too. So when we're, when we're uh, trying to describe how heat moves and the, the resultant temperature and actually energy that's uh, obtained or lost, we have to define what is the system? What are we talking about when we, when we define heat movement? Because you know, um, actually the system can be anything you want it to be, theoretically. It could be anything required to solve a problem. So, um, for instance, 
uh, if we want to discuss the uh, combustion of methane in air, it depends on how you want to do it, right? Do we want to fill the room with methane gas and then set it off? No, you don't want to be in the room when that happens, of course. Or do we want to run that methane gas through a Bunsen burner? So in the first scenario, the system would probably be the whole room and it would blow up. Um, but in the second scenario, your system would be the Bunsen burner. Okay, so we define the system according to our needs. Then everything else is surroundings. Right? System determines what the surroundings are. The surroundings, uh, if you don't say what the surroundings are, you assume that the surroundings are everything else in the universe. Okay? In which case, any change in energy uh, between the two has to be zero because that's total. Okay. This is what it might look like if we say this is our system, then everything else is surroundings. Sometimes it's convenient. In fact, it simplifies problems if we limit the surroundings. If we say we're going to block off the surroundings around our system so that the rest of the universe doesn't matter. We're only concerned with these surroundings and this system. So that's what, there we go. There's our limit. And that's typically, this is much, much more common when you do this. Identify your surroundings, limit the surroundings. And then you, you're able to budget your energy transfers uh, more efficiently. Um, we've got three ways that you can describe a system. And it's based upon this boundary right here between the system and the surroundings. If we say that system is open, that means energy can cross the boundary. And matter can cross the boundary too. Right? And there are numerous systems, especially in the natural world, where that's the case. Now, the crossing of that, usually crossing of matter, sometimes energy also, is controlled, especially in biological systems. But uh, be that as it may, this is known as an open system when matter and energy both can transfer across that boundary. We don't use it too often in, in chemistry. Closed system simply allows energy to move, but not matter. And then um, the last one is off the bottom of the screen. So let's see, uh, can I adjust it from here? Wrong button. What if I do this? Nope, that doesn't work. Oh, page up. Uh, let's see. It's not behaving, is Yeah. We don't just have to narrate it. Third form of um, system is isolated. That's what that word is right here. Isolated system. In other words, there is no exchange of energy or matter across that boundary. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. The system is isolated from the surroundings completely. We use this one, isolated system, particularly in our calorimetry. And that lab we're going to do next week will use an isolated system. But the boundary is made up of two styrofoam coffee cups. And that effectively isolates our system inside the calorimetry from everything else. <clears throat> okay, 
So when a reaction occurs, um, it could either temperature not change at all, or it could release energy and you could feel it getting hot or measure an increase in temperature, in which case we'd be talking about an exothermic reaction. Energy flows out of the system. So in that case, if the reaction occurred and you were able to feel it, then your hand would be the surroundings because energy would be transferred out of the system and you'd feel a heat in your hand. That's exothermic. Endothermic would be the other way around. Your hand would get cold if that reaction took place. And um, illustration of that particular, but one or the other, actually they're both, is in the hospital setting. Um, if a nurse needs a cold pack real quick, like somebody's got a bad headache, um, they've got this bag of water with a, a capsule inside. It's got a chemical in it. You just break it and then you mix it up. And it gets cold really fast. It's very cold. That's an endothermic reaction. They got another bag and you, you do the same thing. You break the capsule and mix it up. It gets hot. Exothermic reaction. <clears throat> okay, let's see if we've got a grasp of what's going on here. Is the freezing of water an endothermic or an exothermic process? In this case, you need to define the system. What is the system? Well, it's the water that's being frozen. Right? Everything else is surrounding it's the environment. Uh, which way is the heat flowing? Well, if you're freezing water, what must happen? Temperature of the water has to decrease, right? In order to make a liquid go to a solid. So heat has to flow out of the system. So freezing of water is an exothermic process. It's kind of counterintuitive. Unless you got all your terms defined and you agree upon what they mean, and then you work from there. Okay. Let's see if we can uh, take these and for convenience, we've defined the system as uh, these underlying terms. And then we're going to say, all right, what happened? Everything else is surroundings, right? So your hand gets cold when you touch ice. So everything is referenced to the system. In fact, uh, when we try to quantify this, our sign convention, plus and minus sign, on the value of the energy transfer is going to be referenced to the system. So when your hand gets cold, that means heat's moving out of your hand, correct? That's an exothermic process. Oops. Yeah, the ice gets warmer when you touch it. Okay, the ice is the system. If it gets warmer, energy is transferred into it. So it's endothermic. Water boils in a kettle, right? it's getting hotter. It has to take energy in from the outside, which means it's endothermic. Water vapor condenses on a cold pipe. It's going from gas to liquid. And when it does that, it has to give up energy, right? So the water vapor in giving up energy is an exothermic process. <laughs> and ice melting is an endothermic process. Okay, now in this one, we're gonna say, all right, you've got to define the system yourself. So let's see, what makes sense in defining the system for these scenarios? Methane is burning in a Bunsen burner in a laboratory. All right. What's the system, what's the surroundings, and what direction is the energy flowing? Well, I would confine, personally, I would confine the system to just the components of the reaction. In other words, the methane gas and the oxygen mixed into it. Everything else is surrounding it. So when that happens, um, the system is the methane and oxygen, the surroundings is the burner and whatever else you connect with. And the direction of energy flow is out. Everything gets hot around it. So it's exothermic. 
I guess it's going to let us just make our own decisions and not tell us the answers. Um, how about water drops sitting on your skin after swimming and they evaporate? So what's the system? Water drops, yeah. Water drops, I'd say they're the system. And when they're sitting on your skin and they evaporate, they're taking heat from your skin. Your skin is the surroundings and the process is endothermic. Heat is being transferred into the system. Okay, that's an understatement. Hydrogen gas and oxygen gas react violently to form water. Right? If you've ever watched a space shuttle blast off, you know how violent that reaction can be. Or if you watched the Challenger disaster live on TV like I did when it happened, um, that was an, a mix of all the oxygen and all the hydrogen in that big orange tank going off at once. And there, well, actually, they said the crew capsule survived. So, but they don't know if the astronauts were still alive inside. But definitely when they hit the water, they were gone. But that's, that was the fuel of the three main engines, hydrogen mixed with liquid oxygen coming from a separate tank. Actually, that big orange thing is two tanks in one. Um, okay, so if hydrogen gas and oxygen gas react to make water, what does it look like? Okay. Hydrogen gas reacts with oxygen gas to make water. Now, if we're in standard conditions, this would be a liquid, but that's not really important right now. But when these things react, um, think about whether this is uh, the system, of course, would be the reactants and products together. So what's happening to the energy? Is it giving off energy, absorbing it? It's giving off energy, which means it's exothermic, correct? An exothermic reaction, when you write the reaction this way, the equation, that's not balanced. Let me balance it. Just I knew something was bugging me. <clears throat> when you write the reaction that way, and it's exothermic, the way to express that here in terms of the equation is to add the energy on this side. Right? And that I'll define what that is later, but for now it just means energy. So energy is being given up because it's on the product side. If it were endothermic, we put that energy term on this side. Energy is going in. So when you look at it that way, um, it's easier to answer this question. Which is lower in energy, a mixture of the gases or water? Well, the energy has to balance before and after. You can't create, destroy it. So if energy is released over here, then this total is equal to that total of energy. So that means this has to be lower in energy than those two because there's some of the energy out of it now. And that's all relative to the, the bonding. And actually, that's one of the driving forces of the reaction. Whenever possible, products try to be lower energy than reactants. That's not always the case. Right? When you're making nitroglycerin, of course, um, your uh, nitric acid and uh, glycerol that you mix together, along with some sulfuric acid, um, you're producing this compound and you're adding energy to and then it goes up here and it's, it's endothermic. Uh, energy goes into the nitroglycerin structure. And it, it sits up here, but it's not very stable. It just takes a little bit of bump and boom, got all that energy back. But what uh, systems try to do is achieve the lowest stable energy state possible. That's where they're aiming. All right, so thermodynamics, we'll just define it for now. Uh, it's just the study of energy and how it 
different interconverts. That's it. That's the very simplest. And when we say thermo, of course, we're talking about heat, but we're we're expanding it to include all energy forms. And dynamics mean motion. Uh, we used to study physics in terms of statics and dynamics. So you start off with statics, where you have uh, little or no motion, and you're balancing forces. Okay. Then you advance to dynamics. When you start to let things move, then, then uh, you're in a different ball game. So thermodynamics is the movement of energy, interconversions of energy. And we saw this one earlier. Okay, um, now that we've defined what our system is, we can say uh, an energy is a state function. In other words, uh, whatever it has, it has, it doesn't matter how it got there, right? So whenever we change the energy in a, a system, the, which we call the internal energy of the system, I, you know, come to think of it, why would you say internal energy? Is there external energy of the system? That's the internal energy of the surroundings, I guess. But that's neither here nor there. Um, this change in internal energy. If you observe a change in internal energy, there are only two ways to make that change. One, you've either got to... Um, add heat to it or subtract heat from it, or you have to do work on the system or allow the system to do work on its surroundings. Those are the only two ways that you can change the internal energy of the system, heat and work. So that's why uh, this is a measure of the, the energy contained in the system, right? It doesn't matter how it got there, but, these two are path functions. So maybe it does take uh, a different path to give you that change in internal. So there's some kind of relationship there between the two. We use this Q to represent heat. And that's always a heat transfer due to a difference in temperature. Whereas work represents the, uh, the change in well, for gases in particular, a change in volume or pressure or both will give you a, a work function on the system or for the system on its surroundings, right? That's the easiest way to uh, understand this term, work. Because with pressure, you can, you can designate a force component. And then if the volume changes, then you can designate a distance component. And they're all related to this uh, definition. And then we can go from there because it, it's not just limited to gases, but it's easier to understand when you talk about it in terms of gases. Then you can, you can advance to liquid and solids. Um, okay. So this internal energy has, um, says, Thermodynamic quantities have two parts. You have the number, and I submit you have three parts. You have the number, you have the unit of measure. Right? I see those as two different things. And you have a sign, which tells you what direction is the energy flowing. Now, I guess with, now you need a, you need a unit of measure because there are several different units of measure that that we could use for energy. The one that we're uh, um, familiar with out in the world is calories. Worry about taking in too many calories and not burning off enough, you gain weight. Um, but in chemistry, we use a different unit of measure called the joules. And I'll define it in a second. Okay, so we need to know something about the sign. The direction of flow is designated by the sign. Is it plus or minus the, the value of this quantity? And to do that, like I said, everything is referenced in terms of the system. Right? 
So if the energy, um, if the internal energy is lost from the system, in other words, it's moving out, then that sign is negative because the system is losing internal energy. And the, the converse is if it's gaining energy, that sign is positive. Now, when we speak of it in terms of uh, heat transfer, exothermic means that the, the value is negative. So anytime you see a negative uh, value associated with a, a chemical change, that is an exothermic process. Okay. Uh, let's see. We can also say the same thing for double work. We have to think of it in terms of uh, who's doing the work and who's receiving the benefits of the work. If we allow the system to do work on its surroundings, then that's a negative value. Because the work, the energy required to do that is leaving the system to do work on its surroundings. And the other way around, if we allow the surroundings to do work on the system, then the system is gaining benefit from it. And the work that's being done on the system adds to its internal energy. And that's a positive value. Oh, I got Professor Dave here. Um, what I'll do is when I, I'll start the video and watch it here. But when I process the video, I've learned how to do that. When I process the video at home, I will insert in this position the original video. So it won't be a recording of a recording, which degrades its quality. So if you look at the, the posted video uh, of this session on Blackboard, this should be a much, it should be a comparable quality. In other words, that's what I'm saying. So let me see if I got the volume up enough. <laughs> or perhaps too high. And he's going to talk about some things here that we haven't discussed yet. So he's sort of introducing the topics and we'll uh, flesh them out afterwards. Hey guys, it's Professor Dave. Let's talk about thermochemistry. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. Thermochemistry is the branch of thermodynamics that deals with the heat absorbed or produced by a chemical reaction. A reaction can either be exothermic, one that releases energy, or endothermic, one that absorbs energy. This change in energy is represented by delta H, or the change in enthalpy for the reaction. For our purposes, we can think of the change in enthalpy as being the change in energy for the reaction, or the energy stored in all the bonds of the products minus the energy stored in all the bonds of the reactants. If there is more energy in the products, delta H will be positive, meaning the additional energy had to be provided, making it an endothermic reaction. If there is less energy in the products, then that additional energy was released, making it an exothermic reaction. Energy, which is the capacity to do work, can have many forms, like mechanical, electrical, chemical, heat, and so forth. And besides quantum mechanical exceptions, energy is conserved. That means it can change forms, like heat energy that evolves when the chemical energy in a broken bond is released, but it won't be created or destroyed. Heat, represented by the letter Q, is a trickier thing to define, but a good way to put it is that heat is the energy that flows between a system and its surroundings due to a difference in temperature. Heat will always flow spontaneously from an area of high temperature to an area of low temperature. For a system, Q will be positive if heat is being absorbed by the system, and it will be negative if heat is being released by the system. When temperature and pressure are constant, Q equals delta H, the change in enthalpy. When we discuss thermochemistry, we will discuss energies in terms of joules or kilojoules. Another common unit used by chemists is the calorie, which is equal to 4.184 joules. 
One calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. This is not to be confused with the food calorie, which is calorie with a capital C. This is actually equal to a kilocalorie, or 1,000 calories, also abbreviated as kcal. A thermochemical equation reports the change in enthalpy for a given reaction in stoichiometric terms. Here, the delta H listed is specific to the molar quantities given by the balanced equation. So if the number of moles of each substance as given were to react, the change in enthalpy would be as listed. To find the enthalpy change for a specific amount of material, just do some stoichiometry. If twice as many moles of material as are listed were to react, then the enthalpy change would also be twice as much as listed. Let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials and as always, feel free to email me, Professor Dave Explains at gmail.com. Notice that uh, the answer to that problem, you meant the sign off. So that implies that energy is going to be in the system. Um, yeah, there were, he, uh, Professor Dave discussed several items that we haven't defined yet. <clears throat> so we will do that. <clears throat> um, I mentioned earlier that. Uh, Work could either be done on the system by its surroundings, or the system could do work its surroundings and the sign convention. So we're going to use uh, a gas to uh, make the connection between the uh, work function and actual work that's being done on a gas, or the work that the gas is doing on the system. Oh, um, when you mentioned calorie, we used to use that definition of calorie um, decades ago. Like when I was when I studied chemistry for the first time, that was the standard. We used calorie. Um, the problem with calories. is that it's difficult for calorie from the fundamental units of the SI system. So that joule is as easy, direct derivation uh, of joule from the SI system fundamental quantities. So calorie is, is convenient to measure because it's just the amount of heat uh, that will raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Right? That's very simple. But it's, it's confined, that's it. I, you can't go from there uh, to other units of measure without that conversion factor. Okay, back to this topic. Um, if uh, we're doing our terms, F is force, uh, D is the distance that the force travels, obviously. Uh, A is the area of the cylinder. Right? We have the cylinder here with a uniform diameter then it will have a uh, area through which it uh, moves up and down. And then a uh, change in volume is a delta V. It's area to here on the gas. Is the gas doing work on the surroundings or is the surroundings doing the work on the gas? 
the gas is expanding, it's doing work on the surroundings. It's pushing it against the force that's supplied by the surroundings. So in this case, the, the value for work should be negative. Okay, let's continue. All right, so in this scenario, we have these equivalences, right? Work equals force times distance, but we also know that pressure equals force per unit area. If we know the pressure on the gas, then we can derive this, we can uh, manipulate that form formula to equal force. So force is pressure times area. Okay, that be inserted right in here. Now, how about the other one? Well, a change in volume is uh, the distance of this move times the area. And now we want to solve for the D. So we can have an equivalent term for D, and that's uh, delta V divided by A. We just plug those values in there and see what we get. Okay. It's, it's showing up on the screen. So this is the force equivalent, and this is the distance equivalent. And then we that here the numerators of the area cancels, and we have work equals pressure times change in volume. In reality, change in pressure times volume. So we would write it like um, work equals a change in pressure times volume. What we're saying here is that under this scenario where the pressure is constant, which would be um, pressure B, uh, pressure or both, okay? In the real world, that's more likely to happen. Okay, so now we have a definition for work in terms of gas, um, a change in volume, against constant pressure, okay? Um, that's just further explanation. It's nothing new. The problem is, remember a uh, change in volume, a change of anything is final minus initial. So a change in volume here would be the final volume minus the initial volume. So if the final volume is greater, as it is here, minus the initial, which is lesser, this value is going to be positive. And if the pressure is constant, then a positive volume change times pressure gives you a positive value, which is a problem, right? Because of our sign convention, everything is in uh, is um, based upon the system. What the system sees, and if the system is is working against this pressure and uh, working uh, against the surroundings, it's transferring energy to the surroundings, which the value it should be negative, right? So that's where the fudge comes in. We have to say that work with our convention is equal to negative pressure times volume change. Okay, that's where that negative comes from and why we have to use it. Otherwise, the calculations would be all wrong. Okay. So, um, uh, our one set of standard units that we use is pressure is in uh, uh, atmospheres. Change in volume is in liters. So the units of measure for this work, if that's all we put in here, liters and atmospheres is one liter atmosphere. Right? If, we, if we have uh, one atmosphere and it moves one liter in volume, then we have a liter atmosphere. But that's kind of like the calorie. That's as far as you can go. Right? What is it related to in terms of units of energy and the units of energy are the joule. So here's the conversion factor. One liter atmosphere equals 101.3 joules. 
So, and, and that's in your uh, useful information. So you don't have to memorize it. Um, so where's the jewel come from? Did I explain that to you before? Where does where the jewel? The jewel comes from. Um, so if um, uh, work equals force times distance, and work is in terms of energy, it's the joule. And distance, the, the SI unit is meters. And what's force? The SI unit for force is the newton. Okay, so one newton meter equals one joule. But what does a newton mean? <laughs> okay, the newton is, uh, of course, honors Isaac Newton, and it's based upon his second law of motion. Force equals mass times acceleration. Okay. So the standard for um, mass is the kilogram. There we go, the kilogram. Acceleration is what? It's a change in velocity. So it's meters per second is your velocity, but it's changing every second. So it's meters, meters per second squared. That's acceleration. So force, Newton, is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. Okay? Well, if that's true, then a kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton, and times a meter is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So one of those is equal to one joule. Okay. If you ever have to convert units and you're stuck with this unit, you can't cancel with that unit. Well, maybe you need the equivalent. Let's plug in that one. Okay. So that's where the joule comes from. Sometimes Newton meter is, is all you need to do. Uh, sometimes you might need kilogram meter squared per second squared. And this is the conversion from liter atmospheres to joules. All right. Uh, which of the following performs more work? Right? So work equals force times distance or negative pressure times a change in volume. That's the one we're going to have to use here. So we've got two atmospheres pressure. Right? There's our pressure. And then what's our change in volume? Well, it's final minus initial, right? It's going from one to four. So it's four minus one, which is three. Three liters. So uh, work is actually negative two atmospheres times three liters, which is equal to negative six liter atmospheres. Okay? This one has a different pressure, three atmospheres, but it's also got a different change in volume. So this one is, what, a negative, how many atmospheres? Three. And the change is final minus initial, which is two. Exactly the same. Okay. There you go. That makes it efficient. See, it's getting hard. Are you trying to stay awake? I have three hours of sleep. Oh. I work on nothing. Okay. I just need to be rocking. I'm not going crazy. I'm just, you know. I understand. <laughs> do what we got to do. Yep. Okay. 
Um, so uh, now we go back to internal energy. Right? We're going to balance work and heat, right? Because internal energy, change in internal energy, right, is what is the what is heat transferred, and then what work is being done. So it's a good thing we've got that sign convention worked out. Otherwise, this would be a mess. Well, let's do this. Let me change that again. Um, change in energy is heat plus work. Give them some separation here. So an endothermic process that performs work. Determine the sign of delta E for each of the following. In this case, that case, that case, and that case. So we got four cases we need to look at. So if it's an endothermic process, what's the sign on this one? Right, plus. And that performs work. And I assume what they're saying is, in terms of the system, the system performs work on its surroundings, which makes this negative, right? Okay, now, if the absolute value, that's what, what these lines say, absolute value. If the numbers are bigger for work than heat, that means this has to be plus, because that exceeds this one. Another way around, if heat exceeds work, then delta E will be negative. Can I put those in there? Oh, I got it backwards. I'm sorry. Work exceeds heat. Work exceeds heat is negative, and heat exceeds work is positive. So puzzled looks on faces. What is our instructor doing? He's losing his mind. That's good enough for the president. It's good enough for me. <clears throat> uh, in another case where you have uh, exothermic. So now we have a negative Q and a positive W because work is done on the gas. Okay. Now it's just the opposite. If work exceeds heat, then it's positive. And if heat exceeds work, then it's negative. Okay. All right. Now, Professor Dave mentioned enthalpy. Enthalpy, and which is designated by H, and more often than not is delta H, a change in enthalpy, um, is related to, but it's not the same as Q. Q is an actual measurement of heat transfer between the system and its surroundings, okay? Delta H <clears throat> and Q is a path function. It depends on what route is taken to get there to transfer the heat. Delta H is a state function. Its only concern is with a delta H is what is it here, what is it there? I don't care how you got there. It helps, I think, to, uh, well, this is the definition of Q, is just the heat transferred to or from the system. Uh, here we go. There must be another slide to this. This is just reiterating the fact that this is uh, delta E, changing internal energy, is Q plus W. Right. So uh, this is, a state function, and these are two path functions. Delta H, there's more. I knew there was more to this story. Um, enthalpy is more, it's easier to think of it in terms of potential. So if, if you've defined a reaction and it's got a delta H value, like Professor Dave showed in that example, that's the potential 
for that reaction to either absorb energy or release energy. It hasn't happened yet. Or when it does happen, it doesn't matter how many steps it takes to get there and what direction it goes. <clears throat> so that's why this value and this value also are state functions. They're referenced more toward potential or what is it right now? Or what is it right now? And what is it right now? I don't care how we got there. Um, this definition is one that um, we need to dig into thermodynamics before it becomes useful. So we just have to accept this at face value. If you want to know the enthalpy of a process, in our case of chemical reaction, you need to know the internal energy and then any changes that occur with pressure and volume. Right. So that actually, this restricts it to gases right, because um, you can change pressure on a, a liquid in a solid and it won't affect the volume at all. So I guess in those terms, it, you could use it for liquids. I mean, if you can measure the pressure, but the volume, if the volume doesn't change, then that term is gone, right? Now that I think about it. Because if this change is zero, then that term disappears. Okay, so it has to be a gas. Okay, so this is the definition of enthalpy in thermodynamic terms. Now, why we want to bother with this? So that we can uh, work our way to that equivalence that Professor Dave mentioned. Under certain conditions, a change in enthalpy is equal to Q. They're, by definition, they're different. Right? But under certain conditions, the value of each is the same. So how do we get there? First, we look at uh, delta E. What's delta E equal to? It's equal to Q plus W. So there's Q plus W inserted into that equation, okay? If the process takes place at constant pressure, then we get the delta, we get the P times delta V, the one we derived earlier. So there's constant pressure. All right. So if uh, work, which we derived earlier, is minus P times delta V, okay, we can substitute that in here for work. Minus P delta V plus P delta V obviously is going to cancel. That's zero. So if that's the case, then under constant pressure, where P is constant for both of these, then delta H equals Q. That's where he got that statement. In a short video, you know, you don't have time to go through all this stuff, but that's what he meant. So, and this is very useful for chemists. If you want to study a reaction, you can't really measure delta H easily if you let all these other factors vary. So what we do is we hold the pressure constant. And then we measure the heat transfer. So there you're getting into calorimetry. The heat transfer then is equal to delta H as long as the pressure doesn't change. And if all of your activities, all the, if the system is entirely liquid, say, then yeah, pressure is constant. There's no change in pressure. So uh, as long as there's no gas being evolved, then you don't have to deal with pressure. Uh, in, in those cases, it's, it's nice. Q, the, you measure the heat transfer, that's delta H. So you can measure the potential by the actual. In other words. Okay. Um, all right, where am I going with this? 
uh, we've got a system, uh, when we study gases, we've got a before and after situation. Let's say the pressure, volume, and temperature are changing. They go from this state to this state. There are many different paths that, can, that you can take from get to one place to the other. You can let the pressure change just a little bit at a time until it gets to there. Or you could let it change almost instantly. That, that's a different path. Temperature the same way. Volume the same way. They can change by increments or they can change all at once. If that's the case, then uh, the, uh, the paths are all different between those two thermodynamic states. That's why we say that Q and W are path functions. Because if you use these to derive uh, either Q or W, as the case may be, you'll find that those values will differ depending on the path that you take. However, delta H, like delta E, is a state function. It's the potential from going from one to the other. Right? And it doesn't matter what happens in between. Now, this is very useful because uh, energy changes associated with a given reaction are invariably reported as delta H, as enthalpy. And it's, it's very useful because uh, of, well, let's see, I'm, I'm headed toward Hess's law. So keep that in the back of your mind. If delta H changes, uh, it doesn't matter how you got there. Right? And if that's the case, then maybe you can go from this reaction and say you want to derive that reaction. Then if you know these other reactions in between, add them together, you can get to that other one. And it doesn't matter how many times you take to get there because delta H won't change. All right? That's actually, I just gave you Hess's law there in you know, one statement. All right. So uh, another way to look at it is we can calculate delta H if we know the delta H for the products and the delta H for the reactants. Now, these terms, uh, this is more of a theoretical, right? a practical approach we'll, we'll get to in a few minutes. But the enthalpy content of the reactants is one thing, and that's stored in the bonds. And then the enthalpy content of the products, that's stored in the bonds. And if you subtract the reactants from the products, then you can get the enthalpy change. And like Professor Dave said, if this one's greater, then the value is positive, and you have a, an endothermic reaction. If this one's greater, then it's negative and you have an exothermic reaction. We always have to keep this in mind. If you let the pressure change, then delta H is going to be different than Q. Q is the actual heat transfer. Delta H is the potential. As long as the P's are constant, then you can equate it with delta H. Okay. Um, so practical applications. If we have this reaction where propane is burned, then uh, it always produces carbon dioxide and water. Anytime you get a hydrocarbon like that burned in oxygen, you get carbon dioxide and water, ideally. You can change the conditions where you, where you get other products like in, inside your car's engine. If you burn protein, propane or uh, some set up for methane. But um, typically you get carbon dioxide and water and this reaction is defined, this balanced reaction is defined in terms of propane. You get a negative 2,221 kilojoules per mole of propane. Okay. Very often you'll find this, that value of delta H, just the number delta H. And that's valid 
as long as it's referencing a balanced equation. For the balanced equation, then you will get this much energy. This is exothermic. You get that much energy from a reaction of one mole of methane requiring five moles of oxygen to produce three carbon dioxide and four water. So if you need to, you can say this in terms of, for that reaction, this many kilojoules per four moles of water. So if you want to say per mole of water, reference to that particular reaction, it would be one fourth of that. But for the whole reaction, it's this value. Uh, suppose we have a reaction where um, there's a coefficient in front of this one, uh, what we would consider the fuel. That would be that value per two moles of the fuel, for instance. Okay. I just wanted to make that point because very often you'll see it without that, that, that per in there. Okay. Now, if we want to use this in a stoichiometric calculation to determine how much energy should, should we gain from five grams of propane and excess oxygen. So it's just like any other stoichiometry. You can't do a calculation unless it's in terms of moles, right? Because this value is in terms of moles. So we've got to turn that into moles moles of propane, and then you know how to do that, right? There's the molar mass of propane, and you find that this many moles actually reacted, right? So if we use this as our conversion factor for a mole of propane, then we find that 252 kilojoules is the, uh, what you should expect to get from that reaction. All right, calorimetry. That's where we actually measure the heat transfer for a process of any kind. Uh, it could be a physical process. It could be a, a chemical process. Doesn't matter. We still use a similar technique to determine the values. Um, but in order to do that, we have to define some terms. Um, every form of matter has the ability to absorb heat or give up heat when it changes temperature. But each form of matter, each compound, each element, uh, each mixture will absorb heat or release heat at different rates depend for a change in say one degree Celsius. Right? Water is very high for one change of, uh, one degree Celsius for water, it will give off or absorb a lot of heat. The heat capacity, which I've just defined, the heat capacity for water is very high. For most metals, it's low. Right? You can add just a little bit of heat to a metal and it will get hot, very hot. So it all has to do with the internal structure of the matter as to how much heat will it absorb or give up for a change in temperature. Yeah. Um, so heat capacity, not, not these terms, but heat capacity itself. Uh, and I use a big C for heat capacity is the amount of, uh, let's see. The temperature change, right, change in temperature that will occur uh, for a given amount mass of substance. So by definition, heat capacity is a capacity factor or an extrinsic property because it will depend, it will change depending on how much mass you have or the change in temperature. Specific heat capacity adds a factor to this. And we designate it, we used to use a little c, but now they use s. 
specific heat capacity also takes into account, um, let's see. Uh, wait a minute, I think I've jumped the gun. Specific heat capacity is um, joules per gram degree C. So gram degree C. Oh, heat. There it is. No, I didn't jump the gun. <clears throat> but you can express um, heat capacity, specific heat capacity in, in two forms. It can be related to the mass of the substance, specific heat capacity, or it can be related to the moles of the substance. Sometimes that's more convenient. So um, think of it this way. If you mix two substances together at the same temperature and the solution gets warmer, this means that the process of the reaction is exothermic. If it gets colder, it's endothermic. And this can happen inside our isolated system. You will, you will see a change in temperature. We're going to hear Professor Dave again. Maybe he'll explain it better. <laughs> we can only hope. Hey, it's Professor Dave. Let's talk about calorimetry. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. Different substances absorb heat at different rates due to various structural factors. The heat capacity of a substance is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of that sample by one degree Celsius. A variation of this that is more useful for calculations is the specific heat of a substance, which is the energy required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Heat, temperature, and heat capacity are all related by the following equations. The amount of heat exchange in a reaction is equal to the heat capacity of the substance times the change in temperature for that substance. Or, more practically, the heat exchanged is equal to the specific heat of the substance times the grams of the substance present times the change in temperature. We can use this information to learn about heat transfer using a process called calorimetry. For those of you in an introductory chemistry course, you'll probably do some variation of a coffee cup calorimeter experiment. Let's look at how those work. A coffee cup is a pretty good insulator. That's why we use it for coffee, so that the heat doesn't escape so quickly and the coffee stays hot for longer. This makes it possible to take pretty reasonable data about the temperature change in a cup of water when we add a hot piece of metal. We can measure the temperature change in the water and use that information to calculate the specific heat of the metal. So, let's say you heat up a metal by placing it in boiling water at a known temperature until it is just as hot as the water. Then, with tongs, you place it in a coffee cup containing a known volume of room temperature water with a thermometer. The water in the cup will heat up slightly as the heat from the metal flows into the water, and we can record the resulting temperature change. From there, we just do some math. We use the specific heat equation and plug in the data for the water. The temperature change is what you recorded. The mass of water in grams is equal to the number of milliliters of water, and the specific heat of water is a known value. This allows us to calculate the heat absorbed by the water. Well, the heat absorbed by the water was the heat released by the metal. So we can take that same quantity of heat and plug it into a new equation for the metal. That value goes there. We weighed the metal beforehand, and this time the temperature change of the metal is from the boiling water 
to the final temperature in the coffee cup so you can solve for the specific heat of the metal. This is useful for identifying unknown metals if you are given a few different specific heats and asked to decipher which metal you are given. Let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials and as always, feel free to email me, Professor Dave Explains at gmail.com. Okay. I misspoke when I was defining heat capacity with a big C. Heat capacity is the change in temperature or a certain amount of heat added. Okay, mass doesn't enter into it. The mass enters into it when you talk about specific heat capacity. Now it's the change in temperature. Uh, actually, uh, Hold on a second. Let's go back to the formula where Q equals S M delta T and C, excuse me. Uh, that's good enough. So in this case, let's look at the units, right? This is in terms of joules, right? This is in terms of grams. In this case, we're not using kilograms, we're using grams. And this is degree C, change in temperature. So what do we need for S in order to give us joules? Well, it has to be joules in the numerator. And then to cancel grams, we put grams down here and change in temperature down here. So those two cancels these just two joules. So this would be the units of measure for specific heat capacity. For um, simple heat capacity, if we take this formula, we actually find ourselves combining these two into our C times delta T. So in this case, Q is equal to the heat capacity times temperature. And the heat capacity is simply joules. Uh, actually, uh, we want joules over here. So this is joules per degree C, because this is degree C has to cancel. So the units of heat capacity are simply joules per degree C. Mass doesn't enter into it, but it will change if you have more of the substance. That's what I was getting at earlier. I just didn't explain it very well. Um, Okay, I'm going to give you a better way than if, I mean, what he did was true, right? The heat gained is equal to the heat lost. That's true. But I've got a, a foolproof way to do it, which incorporates the signs that can change, right? He just sort of ignored the signs. But if you've got a complicated system and lots of heat terms that are being introduced into that system, then that simple equivalence is not going to work. Not very well. There's potential for lots of mistakes there. So when we do our calorimetry next week, we're going to use uh, a double styrofoam cup. Right? We need to be sure that this system is isolated from its surroundings. Okay? We're going to have a thermometer and a, and a cover. We're not going to use a stirrer. I used to use a stirrer in there. And it's, you need to stir. It's got to be mixed. But I found that the stirrers that I had were made of metal. They weren't coated with plastic, so they'd be inert. 
So <laughs> some of the reactions we were investigating would corrode the metal and potentially um, add some side reactions in there that would mess up our calculation. So I just took the, the serves out and we're just gonna stir with a thermometer. If we're careful, you can you know, manipulate it to stir your mixture. Okay, so like I said, this is an isolated system. What happens in the cup stays in the cup. Okay, this is the important part. If everything in here, remember the conservation of energy. Within this isolated system, any changes that occur must be zero. Just like delta E for the universe equals zero, delta E or Q actually, for the sum of all the Qs that happen in here is zero. It has to be. We can't create energy, we can't just destroy energy, and we can't transfer energy from the outside. Okay. That's a vitally important fact. Okay. So when we've got uh, a substance with a known specific heat capacity, joules per degree C per gram, we know the mass, we know the change in temperature, then we can calculate Q for that particular process. Well, within the cup, all those processes have to equal to zero when you sum them up. So that's where we start. Zero equals any heat change for this one, plus that one, plus that one, however many you need. Okay, that's why I think this is better than Professor Dave's system. The way he taught it there, that's the way I learned it. It didn't make any sense then and it doesn't make any sense now because the potential for error is huge when you do it that way. And it's, it's impossible to teach it too. Okay, so we just need to identify the separate processes that take place inside our calorimeter. Be sure that we've got those right, and then the rest, the calculation will take care of itself. Okay, let's start with something really simple. If we have a 100 gram sample of water at 90 degrees C, and we add it to a 100 gram sample of water at 10 degrees C, what will be the final temperature? Well, water, these two samples of water have the exact same heat capacity, specific heat capacity. So if one gives up heat, the other one's gonna absorb it at exactly the same rate with the same temperature change. So what we're saying is that when we put these two together, the temperature is gonna be halfway in between because they're equal masses. So it should be 50 degrees, right? This is the easy one. Now, what if we have 100 gram samples at 90 degrees, we got 500 grams at 10 degrees. Which one dominates? The 10 degree one because it's a bigger mass. So instead of being at 50 degrees, it's not gonna be above 50. It's not gonna be close to 90, it's gonna be closer to 10. So it should be there between 10 and 50. What's the final temperature of the water? Okay. Here's how you do it. Zero, let's start over here. Zero equals Q of the hot water plus Q of the cold water. Those are the only two Qs we have in here, right? So what are they equal to? Well, Q of the hot is S, whatever S happens to be. Actually, it's, uh, let's see, I always forget to put this up here. Ten useful information. So the Q for water is. There it is. So you can find it first. Four point one eight four. So S is four point one eight four um, joules per gram degree C, and they'll be the same for both of them because they're both water. And then the mass of the hot is what? 100 grams. And then times the change in temperature. 
So the change in temperature is final minus initial. What's the final temperature? We don't know. That's the question. So T final minus T initial, which is 90 degrees. Okay. Then we add 4.184. I'm not going to put the units in this one. 500 grams. Now what's the temperature change for the cold water? Well, it's the final temperature minus 10 degrees. Right? So that's the thinking part. That's the hard part, getting this right. We've got all this equal to zero, and we've got one unknown. We can solve it. Okay? So where's my calculator? I don't trust myself to do this one in my hand. So we've got, what do we have terms here? We've got these two, which would be, well, I can't do that one. This is uh, 100 times that is uh, 418.4, like for these two. Okay. And it'll be a different one for this one. It'll be five times that. Which is uh, 2,092. Now, why did I do those first? Because this is going to be times that, plus it's also going to be times this. So it's going to be 4. Point, it's 418.4 TF minus 90 times that one. So that's. Uh, See, right? Seem right. Hold on a second. Okay, that's right. Nine. Okay. So that's uh, 37,656. 37,656 is this term. Okay, so we got that one, that one, and we're going to add this one 2092 times TF minus 10 times that, one, so it's minus 2092 zero. Okay, and that's equal to zero. So what we need to do is get the TS on one side. They're already positive, so let's leave them on this side. And let's find out what this negative and that negative together equals. That negative, I just change the sign, and then I say this one, two, oh, um, nine, two, oh. Change the sign, and we go. Okay, so this one's gonna be, when I move this term and that term over on this side, now they're positive. Five, eight, five, seven, six, one, two, three, four, six. Equals this one plus that. So 418.4 and 2092 is 25. 1.0.4, TF. Okay. So TF is going to be this one divided by that. And let's see. Still got them in my calculator. 23.3. Is that right? How many significant figures? Three. 23.3 degrees. Celsius. Okay. Well, they rounded it off. Well, on a student thermometer, that's probably as good as you're going to get. <laughs> but I know it's a lot of work, but setting it up like this uh, means that the only way you can make an error is in a calculation. Setting it up 
uh, once you've done it correctly, then you can have as many terms as you want out here. And we're going to have one, two, usually three, I think three terms in our labs next week. Okay. And of course, as usual, your review document gives you lots of practice. If you've got time for it, work all the problems in your review document. You can master this. Okay, here's a different one. Now we have a styrofoam cup with 50 grams of water at 10 degrees, and you're taking a 50 gram iron ball at 90 degrees and putting them together. So now we have those two Q terms will have different S values. Except, isn't that the question? No, uh, let's see. Here, S value of iron, 0.45. So it's, it's almost a tenth of water. It doesn't take, it takes a tenth as much energy to raise the temperature of the same amount of iron as water by one degree, okay? So, if you needed a heat shield, you re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from space, and you needed a heat shield, um, iron would probably not be your best choice. Uh, water would be better. Trouble is, water is liquid, right? So you need something that has. Um, well, actually, if you're planning on absorbing all the heat of re-entry in your material, yeah, but don't do that. Um, the heat shield is ablated. That is, it absorbs the heat until uh, a layer absorbs so much heat it breaks loose and just blows away. Now you got a fresh layer. So those are ablated heat shields. The other type of heat shield is one where the heat capacity, the specific heat capacity of the shield is almost nothing. The ceramic bricks. So what it does is it heats up very fast with friction and it transfers that heat to the air around it as it moves through the air. And the, and the air just blows off. It actually ionizes the air. That's why when a spaceship re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, um, it is out of communication for a couple of minutes because the air around it is ionized and you can't get a signal in or out. It's because of that. Uh, back to the problem. So um, the final temperature, is it gonna be 50 degrees, uh, like 10 degrees here, 90 degrees there? It'll probably be, since water is such, is much higher heat capacity, it'll probably be uh, between 10 and 50. Okay, and you can calculate the actual temperature which is asked you to do. We use the same process as before, setting up zero equals Q1, Q2, or Q water, Q iron. And when you're actually doing this in the lab, you're measuring what? You're measuring the temperature of the water. So when they come to equilibrium, what's the temperature of the iron ball? It's the same. It's the same as the water. So the final temperature is the same, it's only the initial temperatures that are different. There we go, 18 degrees is actual temperature. Okay, now to Hess's law. This is where we use enthalpy as the uh, state function to our advantage. Well, what Hess's law says, and it's named after Hess, of course. Hess's law says is that uh, if you want to know the enthalpy of a chemical reaction, but for some reason you don't want to actually do the reaction, perform the reaction, measure the heat, you can calculate the heat of that reaction if you have two or more separate uh, reactions for which you do know the delta H, you do know the impact. 
you can add those together if you follow certain rules. And that's possible because of the state function. It doesn't matter how many reactions you go through to get to your target reaction. Since it's a state function, you can go through a dozen, add them together and find out what the delta H is. Now, why would we want to do that? Let's see, do I have that in here? Yeah. Say um, it isn't necessary to conduct the calorimetry in the lab. You just want to know theoretically what would be the enthalpy of this reaction. It's just a curiosity. The other possibility is maybe that reaction, um, you want to know if it's endothermic or exothermic. And you want to know if it's exothermic, how exothermic. I mean, is it going to give off a huge amount of energy, which would be hazardous to people working in the lab? So in that case, you'd say, uh, this is too much for this lab. We better not tackle that. Or say, okay, we're going to do it, but we're going to use this much, right? Because the enthalpy is proportional to the amount. So it's uh, for safety reasons. You might want to do that. Or uh, a third reason is you don't have the ability to do the reaction. Maybe the material for that reaction is extremely expensive and it would blow your budget for the year just to obtain the reactants. But you still want to know something about it. Oh, one more. Uh, I promise this is the last one. Professor Dave here. I want to tell you about Hess's Law. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. Thermochemical equations can be manipulated to give important data about chemical reactions. We can use them to predict exactly how much energy will be absorbed or released by a reaction, which is very important because we don't want any unexpected explosions. There are two ways we can use tabulated thermochemical data to calculate the delta H of any reaction. The first way requires that we manipulate thermochemical equations in specific ways. So let's be aware of some rules. First, if a reaction has a particular delta H, the reverse of the reaction will have the opposite delta H or the same number with reversed sign. Second, if molar quantities in the equation are multiplied by a coefficient, so is the delta H. So if you double all the substances, double the delta H. These are things we can do to thermochemical data to be able to add equations together to result in a reaction we are curious about. Here's what I mean. Let's say we want to know about the change in enthalpy associated with a reaction, like this one. But it is difficult to measure experimentally. We can take other reactions with known enthalpy changes and rearrange them to align with our equation and get the data we want. The first reaction provided has carbon graphite on the left, which is where we want it. But the equation we want has two moles of graphite, so let's double this one. We get two moles of everything instead of one, and we double the delta H. Next, this other one has CO on the right, where we want it, and in the right amount. So all we need to do is add these equations together. The O2 and CO2 will cancel because they are present in the same amounts on both sides, and we are left with the substances in our original equation. Since we added the equations, we also add the delta H's to get the delta H for our equation. This kind of manipulation is allowed by Hess's law. We can manipulate the coefficients of a reaction or reverse its direction in any way necessary as long as we change the delta H associated with it in the appropriate way. Then we add or subtract the equations as necessary to give us precisely the equation in question. The delta H you get by doing the arithmetic will be the delta H for the reaction.
Another way to calculate an unknown delta H is to use standard enthalpies of formation. This is denoted by the following symbol, and it represents the enthalpy associated with forming one mole of a substance from its respective elements in their standard and most stable state. Most stable state means the most common allotrope, or physical form, of an element. So carbon graphite instead of diamond, diatomic oxygen instead of ozone, and so forth. Standard state just refers to standard temperature and pressure, which is room temperature and atmospheric pressure at sea level. That's what is meant by the degree symbol. We can calculate the change in enthalpy for a reaction by adding up the standard heats of formation of the products and then subtracting the sum of the standard heats of formation of the reactants. The heats of formation can be found in your textbook or online, and you just plug them in, multiplying each value by the coefficients in the balanced equation. Let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials and as always, feel free to email me, Professor Dave Explains at gmail.com. You missed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> Professor Dave uh, did a pretty good job of explaining Hess's law and how to use it. He mentioned one other way, standard heats of formation. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. First, we're going to look at uh, Hess's law. And then, for instance, if this is our target equation, and uh, these two distinct equations with their enthalpies are available, then we need to see, uh, can we rearrange them? Right. So this one has nitrogen and one oxygen and two nitrogen monoxide. So this gives us the nitrogen, it gives us one of the oxygens. And this equation gives us the other oxygen. And it also gives us the product. But we need to be sure that when we add these together, that this one cancels. Right? And it does. Two moles on this side, two moles on that side. So it will cancel out. Let's see, we're going to do that. Yeah. And then when you add them together, they actually equal this value. Now, did we do anything uh, to these the equations that would require manipulating these? Values, no. We took the face value, we didn't have to change them any, and then we just add these two values together, and this is the enthalpy for that equation based upon those two reactions. This is just an energy diagram explaining the um, state function approach. Right? You start from here, you go there, but then you take this one and you go down there, it's the same change in enthalpy as if you went straight from this one to that product. That's all that means. Okay. Um, these are just the rules that he already gave you. If you have to invert the equation to get reactants and products on the proper side, you just change the sign on your delta H. If you have to multiply an equation by some coefficient, even a fractional value, I've done that before, whole numbers or fractions, then you, you do that for the entire equation. Say if we had an equation like this, uh, A plus B equals C plus D, and it has a delta H 
equal to, I don't know, 50. If you multiply that, let's see, where was I headed with this? Oh. What I like to do is if I'm going to have to multiply this thing by a coefficient of some kind, then I put brackets around that and the delta H to be sure I don't miss that step. Then if I put a value out here, say a two, then two times that, two there, two there, two there, and two here. Okay. It's just little techniques to, to keep, to protect me from myself. <clears throat> okay. So here's an example. Um, and this is actually, I didn't make allowances for bathroom breaks today. Um, this is actually a standard heat of formation for ammonia in reverse. And this is a standard heat of formation. This is not a standard heat of formation because why? Well, I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> but if you have this information available, can you calculate the delta H for this reaction? So it's helpful to work. So if we want to make that, so this one's going to have to be inverted. And water's on this side, but it's on that side there, so that one's going to have to be inverted. So we'll change the sign of each one of these. And then what else has to happen? Well, we need four ammonias. This one's only got one. So we have to multiply by four in addition to inverting it. And this one, we've got two waters here, but we need six. So this one's going to have to be times three in addition to inverting it. And those, all those changes have to be taken into account with your delta H's. So reverse the two equations, right? Here's the reversing of the equations and we change the signs. And now we're gonna, we have to multiply this one times four to get four ammonias and multiply this one times three to get three waters, uh, six waters, excuse me, because we have two here, six waters. And then we multiply these values also by four and three. When we do that, you get these values where hydrogen cancel because they're on opposite sides and equal amounts. And then we can add the equations together. That's one condition. If you cannot add these equations together and get the target equation, then it's not valid to add these together either. But in this case, it does work. And we find out that this reaction should have an endothermic value of 1,268 kilojoules. So we have to put energy into this to make the reaction go to the right. Now, what do I mean by standard enthalpy of formation? The standard enthalpy of formation is for compounds only. Uh, elements in their standard state do not have an enthalpy of formation because they're pre-existing. That's what we assume. Element is pre-existing, so it has no, it has a zero delta H, delta H formation under standard conditions. And he said standard conditions are what? One atmosphere, room temperature, which is 25 degrees C in chemistry. Uh, it's pretty hot, but that's our standard. And if there are any solutions involved, then the concentration of the reactant has to be one molar. Okay, those are standard conditions. The standard enthalpy formation for elements is zero. Okay, that does simplify things. <clears throat> so, how do we get the standard enthalpy formation? 
you start with the product. The product is your compound. So if we have, uh, let's go back to that ammonia. We're going to form ammonia under standard conditions. It will be a gas. All right. Okay. Now, how do we form it? We have to form it from its elements in their most stable state under those conditions. So that means we need hydrogen and we need nitrogen. And in their most stable states, they're diatomic, two and two, and they're gases. Okay? So this can only be one mole. So unlike balancing equations in the past, you can't touch that. You can't touch the subscripts or the coefficient for this value. That has to be one every time. So we have to use fractional coefficients over here. So we need three hydrogens. That means we need three halves as a coefficient. We need one nitrogen. That means we need one half as a coefficient. That's how you do standard enthalpies. So if if you look at a reference manual and it says uh, the standard enthalpy of formation of propane is some value, it means that you have to, if you need the reaction itself, you've got to build it from carbon, which most stable is graphite. And hydrogen, which is gaseous diatomic. Then we need eight hydrogens, so we go to four there, and three carbons, put a three here. So whatever value you have here is based upon that reaction. You always have to have one mole here. Okay. <clears throat> So once you have those values, then you can use, um, let's see, I already told you this stuff, one atmosphere, one molar, it has to be a pure substance uh, for to form it, pure substance, a pure, well, the compound has to be pure, of course, and then the elements have to be in their most standard state. Um, I'm not going to waste any time on this one. What, what it means is, uh, um, actually, this is not a good representation because when you do the delta H for this reaction, this, these are the delta H's of the products right here. So they go from here, and these are the reactants, and they go from here. Actually, no, they're not. Wait a minute. No, those are in proper order. It's just that, this negative sign out here is for the reactants. Okay, so technically that's true, but it's awful confusing. Um, okay, so if we want to determine the delta H for a reaction using standard enthalpies of formation, then all you need to do is um, say, well, we're going to have an example in a minute. You just need to add up all the values for the products and subtract all the values for the reactants. If there are any elements in there, they're zero. Uh, if you have a coefficient times one of the compounds, remember, standard enthalpy is based on one mole. So if you have a two or three or four in front of it, or even a fraction, you multiply that times the value before you add it to the total. Uh, here's an example, right? So in this case, we would only need the value for this one, because that was zero, and this one, because that was zero. So we take this one and subtract that. Two times this one, two times minus 470. 470 minus two times water, 286 minus two. So this becomes a positive sign, that's a negative sign. 
And when you do that math, you get minus 368 kilojoules, which means this reaction is exothermic, very exothermic. All right. Now for our, our closing discussion, I forgot my soapbox. Let's pretend I'm on a soapbox here. Because um, we'll start talking about facts and then we get into politics. And I, I try to stay away from politics because it rubs people the wrong way. As long as I can stay with the facts and I feel confident to discuss the topic. Fossil fuels. Actually, historically speaking, what did we begin with for energy sources? Biomass, like wood, uh, dried uh, straw from the field, dried animal dung is still used in the third world as an energy source. So for our developing Western civilization, we started with wood until we cut down all the forests. Um, Spain used to be forest wall to wall from coast to coast, north and south. And uh, one theory is that they used it all up to, for energy. The other theory is they used a lot of it up to make their armada before they went, sailed on Britain, which both are probably true. But we used up our wood and we found that during the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, in order to uh, uh, smelt iron from iron ore, we needed coke. In other words, a very pure form of carbon to do that reaction. And initially, what we did was we took wood and put it in these uh, use once, throw away uh, earthen and uh, stone piles. And we put it all in there, and that was to exclude oxygen. Because if you have oxygen in there, you're going to convert your wood to carbon dioxide and water. You want to convert it to carbon. So you wanted a process called pyrolyzing. You wanted to pyrolyze the wood. In other words, turn it into carbon plus all that other stuff, which would be absorbed by the, the casing that's holding it in there. And that's what we did for a long time. And... Um, the, there was a limited supply. We didn't have enough. So somebody somewhere, I don't know who it was, it could have happened in several locations, discovered coal. Coal is a more concentrated form of, of energy and carbon. So coking carbon out of coal was more efficient. And that gave the industrial revolution a boost. So we went to, to fossil fuels then. Coal was first. Then we found that natural gas and petroleum were also available. And what, was, what was it, Drake sank his Pennsylvania well? I don't know if he was the first one, but he's the one who gets credit for it. And started pumping oil out of the ground. And fossil fuels became our source of energy for a long time. Then we found out um, we could, uh, if we could get enough pressure head on water, we could run it through a turbine and drive a, a generator. So that's where hydroelectric came from. Problem with hydroelectric now is we've used up all the good sources. You, know, you need a narrow channel with lots of water flow behind it to, to build up the pressure behind the dam. And then you can run it through your turbines. If you have a low pressure head, then your turbines are not gonna spin very fast and not gonna be very efficient. So we've used up all the good sites in this country. Now, if you wanna build your own, I've seen that done, like a, a one person build their own hydroelectric. Um, it's pretty neat to, to see, see videos on YouTube about that. You can do that because you don't need a lot of water to do it. And you can dam it up here and then run a pressurized pipe down the hill far enough to give you enough pressure head and then run your generator down there. But on a, on a commercial scale, we've done all we can with hydro. And the other problem with hydroelectric is uh, those sources of water, when they're in motion, do what? They carry sediment, right? The faster the water, the bigger the particles they can carry. So once they go into a reservoir, they slow down and what happens? 
sediment drops out. So eventually you silt in your reservoir if you don't dredge it out. Uh, and then nuclear came along, peaceful uses of nuclear. Um, and that's another topic. And it, it's actually um, a very good source of energy. It's just, it's gotten a bad rap over the years because um, of mismanagement, Way primarily. Safer than oh yeah, more it makes it safer and efficient. And this is as the people die each year from the um, releases from burning fossil fuels that people think of, you know, like uh, <clears> when they use nuclear, they think of like a Chernobyl disaster. Mm -hmm. But when you look at how much uh, nuclear power we have actually used in the history of it, the amount of deaths per how much energy we use is actually really low and a lot lower. Yeah, it's like um, the disasters uh, are the outliers. It's like plane crashes versus car accidents. We kill a whole lot more people with car accidents in this country. But the plane crashes, and when they go down, they kill a lot of people at one time, and they get the news. Right? It's like that with, with nuclear. Um, so uh, this is like a historical record. Uh, wood here started off big, and now it's kind of down. We use it domestically. Uh, individuals. I've seen, I watched this one place uh, when I drive to church on Sunday. I go by this one house and it's stacking up wood. They got a wood splitter out there. I'm sure he's going to sell it for, for uh, on the side of the road, he's going to sell it. But the pile has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger at, um, through the summer. <clears throat> and people still use it in, in their, um, to heat their homes. Coal started off real big and drop down some but it's it's coming back up uh, because one of the reasons is we've got so much of it um, oil uh, petroleum and natural gas um it this doesn't take into account the trump years that that went shot way up during trump years because we became a net exporter of oil and gas under his uh, presidency um, and hydro and nuclear, they put together. There are certain countries in this in this world that uh, are very high users of nuclear power. Uh, France is one. Yep. Germany. Germany. Mm -hmm. um, A lot of countries are actively dismantling nuclear power plants because of the bad rap that they get. It's stupid, really. Now. Um, the technology for accessing that nuclear power is, can be, uh, can give nuclear uh, a bad taste. Um, and in this country, somehow, some part of the industry convinced the government that the only way to go was high pressure water, nuclear reactors. And that is a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> because corrosion is so prevalent and because under the extreme pressures, if you spring a leak, that water is going to instantly flash to steam. Isn't it because it was the cheapest one? It could have been. Yeah. It was like the cheapest pump that are like, do the cheapest pump that they can take money. Yeah. Um, whenever you see a nuclear reactor in this country, they will always have a big dome, concrete dome. The only purpose for that dome is to give the steam someplace to go. Because the reactor is this little bitty thing down here. And under pressure, if it springs a leak, um, liquid, a uh, rule of thumb, liquid to gas is about a thousand to one change in volume. So with all that pressurized water in there, it's got to have some place to go. Anyway, um, there are more efficient ways to use uranium than the ones we're, using, we're doing now. Uh, and there are other sources of nuclear power. I have a question about mm -hmm. thorium. Thorium is a good source. And, it can't, and the thorium can't use it to make nuclear weapons either. Can't use it to make nuclear weapons, and it will not run away. Right. If you lose your coolant, it will not melt down. Um, and it's a black and it's 
Oh, paper, yeah. And uh, the half-life of it is in thousands of years, probably hundreds of years. Yeah. And nuclear waste would be a lot less. So there you go. That's our solution. And if uh, if somebody gets in your face and starts screaming about global warming, right? Ask them, do you support the expanded use of nuclear power? If they say no, then you can call them to their face. For, you have my permission to call them a damn liar. Because their purpose in, in putting down fossil fuels is not the carbon dioxide that it generates, it's political power. Because they won't go for either one. And nuclear power uh, eliminates that carbon dioxide as a problem. I mean, I don't think it's a problem, but you know, for argument's sake, you can eliminate that one right there with nuclear power. Simple. I think we should be using nuclear power as a crutch to keep developing the technology to transition to fully sustainable and see what solar power. Sure. While they keep developing that technology, we can use that, which is a lot safer than putting so much carbon in the atmosphere. Because uh -huh. it's not just, you know, trapping heat years, it's killing people. People right. are getting like Answer from all of the models. If you look at it from a business standpoint, you know, a cost benefit, um, the quote, sustainable energy sources are never going to be efficient enough not to, to maintain the world economy. Um, so that's a pipe dream. But we could use fission nuclear power uh, for a, a very long time and eventually uh, end up at fusion power, which is infinitely more uh, energy dense than fission is with no waste products. Not from the reaction itself. The, the supporting uh, technology, you know, might create its own pollution problem, but based on how much energy you get out of it, that wouldn't be an issue. Oh, yeah, I've heard that one too. I can't remember the name either. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. We just uh, sur for. surround the sun and absorb all its energy, and then the earth will go dark. It, unless you transfer the energy to the earth. Um, okay, so um, the earth's atmosphere is composed of numerous gases. The primary gas is nitrogen, of course. It's totally transparent to light. Oxygen uh, takes various forms um, mm -hmm. and uh, those are the two main components. The ones that they're blaming carbon dioxide for a greenhouse effect. At these concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, uh, around 400 parts per million. Um, that is not enough to cause the temperature, the global climate changes that they claim to have uh, observed. It just doesn't work. Now on a planet like Venus, oh yeah, You've got, you've got per large percentages of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. And they contribute to global warming. Plus it's Venus, like carbon dioxide. yeah, plus Venus is closer to the sun. So they're getting more radiation to start with. About four times as much radiation. Um, but the theory behind it is light uh, reaches the Earth's surface and it's absorbed by whatever here, plants, minerals, whatever, and it's re-radiated at longer wavelengths. That's true. The longer wavelengths uh, don't make it back into space as easily as the shorter wavelengths made it to the Earth. So whatever's in the atmosphere, it, the claim is, is absorbing that energy and keeping it here, which when you think about it, is not a bad thing. 
If we re-radiated all the energy coming from the sun, turn into a snowball very quickly. So we need some greenhouse effect to, to make this planet livable. Um, but the one other thing that they ignore is the fact that uh, carbon dioxide is not the most efficient absorber of infrared radiation that's being sent back into space. There are other compounds that are more efficient, like methane. That's why they, they're coming down on cow farts. Um, but even though water is less efficient at absorbing infrared radiation, there's a whole lot more of it. You know, orders of magnitude more water in the atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide. 29% of light from the sun reflected back up to space. Okay. Okay. So, uh, not to say that there aren't atmospheric pollutants, right? There definitely are. Some of those um, have absolutely nothing to do with global warming. You know, what they're doing is damaging various parts of the atmosphere that we need to maintain. For instance, uh, ozone. Ozone is a much more efficient absorber of UV radiation, which would contribute to more skin cancer if we didn't have that protective layer. So when they talk about the ozone hole at the poles, which is naturally where it will occur, um, you don't want to stay up there <laughs> too long without protection, or you don't want to fly high altitudes um, without protection. My brother's a pilot, so he flies regularly at 20, 30,000 feet. And he, he probably gets more UV radiation than I do in a year in one flight. Um, but what these pollutants do is, some of them, they catalyze the destruction of ozone. So uh, chloro, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, freon, is notorious for that. Wasn't that, um, that it was like, Spray or something, or like a, a hairspray or something that was used so widely in like the 70s or 80s that yeah. it contributed a lot to the whole. Yeah, <clears throat> those, those are fluorinated uh, hydrocarbons, and they're, they're good because they have um, low vapor pressure. In other words, you, you compress them into a can. Then when you open the valve, they just come. They're good propellants, in other words. So what are some solutions, new energy sources? Well, this one's been around for quite a while. Convert coal to gas. Gas is less polluting, according to how much carbon dioxide it produces per kilowatt of energy. Um, but then when you convert coal, when you do that, you're going to have waste because coal is more than just the carbon. Right? Coal has ash load and it varies depending on the quality of the coal. Like anthracite coal has very low ash and that's what steel companies are looking for. Um, or, uh, well, they're looking for low ash but the low sulfur too to make their coke. But uh, bituminous coal has more ash, but it, it's useful. And then there's uh, lignite, and it's just dirty coal. <laughs> hydrogen. The hydrogen is, in one sense, the holy grail of transportable energy. Because when you burn it, you get nothing but water. So if we could find a way to um, harness the use of hydrogen as a fuel, uh, for almost any reason, for, for any source, uh, commercial power or to drive your vehicle. Um, that would be good because all you need is a steady source of electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And that's where nuclear comes in. Right? Because nuclear energy doesn't pollute those other things and it produces 
copious amounts of power that you could use to split hydrogen. But on top of that, you have the infrastructure question. We don't have the infrastructure built to handle hydrogen. It's very localized. California, of course, they like to dabble in, in the, their fantasy world more than the rest of the states. Um, and then we need a fuel cell technology to really make it efficient use of hydrogen. And that's still in the works. So the fuel cell plus the storage. Right? Hydrogen is a, a flammable gas. Right? How are you going to put that in your car without running risk? There are some solutions working on it. Low pressure storage is one. Okay, energy alternatives. Well, we saw the, uh, the explosion of oil and gas production from fracking. That's what made our export, the ability to export fossil fuels during the Trump years available. He just opened the floodgates on fracking. And, and that made, actually it made old uh, oil beds available because you can only pull so much out of, out of the ground with standard equipment before it just, it's not economical anymore. So they go in and frack it and it just, it just opens the, the floodgates for uh, oil and gas from old developed uh, energy zones. Let's see, um, ethanol, I, that's a pipe dream. When you use biomass to make ethanol, it takes more energy to make a gallon of ethanol than there's energy stored in it. So that's, that's a, a waste of money. And it wouldn't exist in this country if it weren't for government intervention. What's the adage? Uh, if you uh, subsidize it, you get more of it. This is from the government standpoint. If you tax it, you get less of it. So they subsidize the hell out of ethanol. So they take all this corn and make ethanol out of it very inefficiently when it ought to be used as a food source. Uh, methanol is another possibility. It's just another type of alcohol. Oil seeds. Actually, uh, diesel engines were originally developed by Herr Diesel, German inventor, to run on vegetable oil. It was only later that we converted the diesel engine to use uh, petroleum-based products. But you can, uh, if you if you have a diesel engine in a vehicle, uh, and you want to run it on on uh, cooking oil from a restaurant, they'll give it to you. You can do that. What you have to do is you have to put a, a preheater in. It has to be it has to be hotter than room temperature before you inject it into your engine. Otherwise, it'll gum it up. Anyway, um, solar, it has numerous problems. Solar and wind, which wind is another form of solar. Right? Without heating the earth, you won't have wind. Photovoltaics versus and wind sources of energy. They have problems. Intermittent availability is big. They are not consistent sources. In fact, just recently, Northern Europe was in an energy crisis because they have lots of these uh, wind farms out there in the North Sea. And usually the wind is blowing constantly in the North Sea, but some unusual weather condition developed and it just went dead calm for several months. And they were, they were uh, the, uh, energy costs spiked because of that. And that made them buy more, buy more gas from Russia, which puts them at under the thumb of, of Putin. <clears throat> we warned him, but they went ahead and did it anyway. Don't buy your gas from Russia. Inefficient storage technologies, right? You need batteries. If you want to bridge the gap between dead zones, dead times, you need efficient batteries. And they're still in development. Not even uh, lithium ion batteries are efficient enough. You need something 10 times that efficient. And as always, 
the economics are not competitive. Right? If it weren't for government subsidies, these photovoltaics and wind sources, they would be, the market wouldn't stand. They could not survive without government subsidies. Uh, and then there are the environmental hazards during the production of the technologies. And then at the end of life, what do you do with all that spent voltaic, photovoltaic cells and wind turbines? You got to get rid of the waste. They only last for so long and then they're junk. So nuclear solves all of these problems for the foreseeable future. And they, nuclear power, even the, the pressurized water reactors can be made safe. It's just that nobody wants to do it. The regulatory problem is number one. It takes you, it used to take 10 years fighting with the government before you could even break ground. And nobody can, can stand, <laughs> their investors won't stand that. 